Yeah, so wave power is an immense source of electricity, of clean electricity. According to the World Energy Council, wave energy can actually produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Loomi Tech and sponsored by Hippo Insurance, Turing, Upwest Labs, and Hillel at Stanford. This story is incredible. From a near-death experience as a child to making an impact that can literally change the world. Meet Ina Braverman, co-founder and CEO of EcoWave Power, LTD. Ina founded EcoWave Power at the age of 24. Under her leadership, the company installed its first grid-connected wave energy array, secured a significant projects pipeline of 254 megawatts, and became the first Israeli company to ever list on NASDAQ Stockholm. She was recognized by Wired Magazine as one of the females changing the world, by Fast Company as one of the world's most creative people in business for 2020, and is the winner of the United Nations Global Climate Action Award. Ina Bravelman, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm excited to talk all about electricity today and your personal journey. Uh, I'm going to let you talk about the, the fascinating details as much as you feel comfortable to, of course. But just a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, founded EcoWave Power at 24, recognized by Wired Magazine as one of the females changing the world, by Fast Company as one of the world's most creative people in business, and with the winner of the United Nations Global Climate Action Award. Uh, Ina, I, I can't even imagine what it takes to get to 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 the level of, of to to this uh, amazing uh, contribution and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing that in the next 20 minutes but can you perhaps take me back all the way to this occurrence that you had as a newborn and and what happened there and how did that sort of transform your your life and your mindset into where you are today Yes, so I live in Israel, but I was born in Ukraine on uh, the 11th of April, 1986. And two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear uh, reactor exploded. Uh, it was on the 26th of April. And uh, it was the worst in history nuclear disaster in terms of costs and casualties. And many adults and children got uh, heart problems, respiratory problems, cancer, and even death because of uh, as a direct uh, result of the explosion and I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of such explosion. I actually had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. And my wow. mother just approached my crib, she looked down and she saw me pale and blue and not breathing and she freaked out. She ran to my dad and she said like, oh my God, oh my God, my baby is dead, what do I do? And he shook her physically and said, you're a nurse, do something. And then she remembered that she's a nurse and gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, resuscitation, which actually saved my life until the ambulance came. And uh, obviously, I don't remember all of this. I was a baby, but uh, I grew up and my parents kept telling me this story. So I felt, wow, like I got a second chance in life. I should definitely do something special with it. I have a purpose. And I, throughout my whole childhood and early adult life, I was looking for like an amazing purpose that could really make my second ch chance, you know, important and worthwhile. So what is it like growing up, you know, having this pretty much death experience as a baby? You're getting resurrected by your own mother and nurse. And uh, I, I can't think of m many crazier stories that I've ever heard than the one that you just told me. But what do you, what, how, wh when does it actually become a part of you, this idea that I, had a ch I, ha I am giving a second chance at life. I'm going to make the most out of it. And I'm not just for myself, but I'm going to do something that is going to make a direct impact on the world. Is that also, you know, as you're a kid or does that only formulate later on? So as a kid, I, I felt special, you know, I felt like, okay, it's out of the ordinary, my uh, kind of background story. And I did feel that I want to do something special, but obviously I didn't have enough information or knowledge in order, in order to know at a young age what really I would like to pursue. Uh, so uh, when growing up, uh, when we moved to Israel from Ukraine, uh, we moved to a very small town called Akko. So it, it wasn't very, back then there was not even cinema or a shopping mall in the city. The city was like kind of uh, just starting, let's call it like that. 
So as a kid, uh, I dreamed of maybe becoming a politician because I thought that through politics, that's my best chance to kind of make a positive impact on the world. And that's why when I went to Haifa University to study, I chose to study political science and English literature with the hope of becoming this great politician, which would really have an impact on people's life. But uh, when I finished the university, um, and I'm sure that some students can uh, relate with it, I didn't have a lineup of politicians that are waiting to hire a political science major. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was not knocking on my door. And uh, so I said to myself, okay, like I'm older already, I finished university, like, you know, I need to go to work. And uh, I, look at, uh, I looked at the famous uh, job search uh, website in Israel and there was, a, there was like a, an ad that is looking for a Hebrew, Hebrew English translator at a renewable energy company. And I worked there for one year. It wasn't really my cup of tea, but uh, I did discover there the whole world of renewable energy. I discovered there is solar energy and wind energy and wave energy. And what really drew me to wave energy specifically is that solar and uh, wind energy were already like commercialized industries. You had many companies developing many different technologies and like it was already there. It was already existing and wave energy, all the engineers and all the scientists they really were trying to develop something viable and commercially, you know, commercially viable. And no matter how much money was invested and how much effort was put into it, they really couldn't make it work. So being, you know, an Israeli with what we call chutzpah, I said, okay, I'm from a little town. I have no money, no contacts, and no technical background, but I can make it. Ha I can make it happen. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of my passion, uh, where I started really researching about uh, wave energy. And uh, did we forget to mention that you're 24 at this point? Yeah, so when, uh, when I established Eco Wave Power, uh, together with my business partner, David Lebo, I was uh, 24 years old. Now, that, that's, that's fascinating. And that mindset, the shift, I had no idea that you went to study political science. And, and you know, I, I bet that when you decided that that's what you're going to study, uh, you, you don't imagine that one day the United Nations is going to crown you as Global Ki Climate Action Award winner. Uh, and so take me, take me through this understanding that you have. You're 24, you're starting this, you're starting this company, you have a business partner. What is the thesis? What is this, you know, revolutionary aha th idea that you have that says, I think I know how to make a big impact? So uh, you don't really know when you're starting that I'm going to make a big impact. You're just kind of following your passion. And I really felt passionate towards this field. I really researched it. Uh, I saw what was the problem of all the larger companies that were trying to develop wave energy solution. I understood that the main problem was in the fact that they're trying to go offshore four or five kilometers into the sea. So then it becomes super expensive. You need ships, you need divers, you need underwater moorings and underwater cables. Uh, it breaks down all the time because in the offshore you have wave heights of 20 meters and even higher. And unfortunately, no man-made stationary equipment can survive the loads. It wasn't insurable and it wasn't environmentally friendly. Environmentalists, which were supposed to be the greatest supporters and proponents of wave energy, were actually objecting it because it created a new presence on the ocean floor which disturbed the marine environment. So I kind of understood that in order to have a commercially viable product, we need to solve these four problems. But again, as I said before, I did not have the financial resources. I did not have uh, really the, the obvious uh, in order to make it happen. And uh, in a social event, I met my business partner, David Lebo, who is a serial entrepreneur. And uh, when he just sat next to me and we didn't, he didn't know who I am, I didn't know who he is. And he asked me just like, what's your passion? And I said, wave energy. And it turned out that his passion was also wave energy uh, because he invests a lot in real estate. And one of his investments was a surf camp, a surf hotel in Panama. So he was sitting there watching the power of the waves and thinking, wow, there must be something better that you can do with wave power other than, you know, sports and surfing. So when I said to him, like the same thing he was research researching about in a completely different, you know, area of the world, it was like, uh, it was like it's meant to be. And that was really the birth and the beginning of uh, eco wave power. Okay, so the, the beautiful, you know, childhood background, even more beautiful uh, partnership with your with your business co-founder. What, what, how do you get to then, you know, securing this 
this pipeline of 254 megawatt. I don't even know if I'm reading this correctly because I, I need to learn so much more about this. But what, what was this project? What, what is the impact that EcoWave Power actually has? And what is the solution that you're actually providing? So basically, we developed a solution that is solving the four main problems that I've mentioned before. Uh, instead of going to the offshore, far into the sea, we install an existent man-made structure such as breakwaters, piers, jetties, and other types of structures. We basically attach floater to the external side of the marine structure, of the breakwater, and these floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves. They're pushing a hydro cylinder which transmits biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. A pressure is being built in the accumulator, the higher the waves, the higher the pressure. And this is used to turn the hydro motor, which is turning the generator and goes to the grid via an inverter. The whole system is controlled by a smart automation system. And when the waves are too high for the system to handle, the floaters automatically rise above the water level and they stay in the upward position until the storm passes. Very similar to wind turbines. When the wind is too strong, the wind turbine actually stops turning. So we basically just Again, we made it a bit the Israeli way. It's very, very simple, not a lot of moving parts, like smart automation, smart software, but very simple hardware, because you don't want something complicated in the marine environment. So I think this is really what we did correctly. And, and how do you get to then securing this incredible project? I don't even know what, what that number that I said means, this 256 megawatt pipeline, but what, what, how, how does that happen? So it happens uh, step by step, you know, we started, uh, first of all, we had an idea, but we didn't know if the idea even is feasible. So we took an engineering team and the engineering team really made the calculation and the blueprints and everything that is necessary to go to the next step. Our next step was doing a wave pool testing, you know, to check kind of in a controlled environment, a controlled environment to check the workability of the technology. We did it in the Hydromechanical Institute of uh, Kiev in Ukraine. Uh, because we could save costs by doing so. When we received approval from the Institute for the Workability of the Technology and recommendation to enlarge it to greater sizes, we did an off-grid power station in the port of Jaffa in Israel that worked between 2014 till 2020. So then people came to the power station and says, wow, like it doesn't break down and it's really cost efficient and we see it's insurable and environmentally friendly, but can you connect to the grid? And then in 2016, we opened our first grid-connected power station, which was in Gibraltar, still operational in Gibraltar. It was the first time we attempted to actually connect to the grid. And since then, wow. when we really felt uh, comfortable with the, you know, that we have a strong basis for the technology and that we already had the grid-connected experience, we started contacting uh, suitable ports or breakwaters owners, and they started, con and governments and municipalities and ports started contacting us because they thought to themselves, look, we have these huge breakwaters, it's not prime real estate. Actually, the breakwaters are also not very environmentally friendly. You put cement in the water and obviously that's not really natural, but you have to do it to protect the coastal populations and the port. So you take this unused structure that is just used for you know, breaking the waves and you turn it into something good. You turn it into a source of clean electricity, a source of revenues for the port, a, a place where you can uh, create employment opportunities in a new green energy industry. So that's how kind of our commercial rollout started. We're just in the beginning wow. of the commercial rollout. Uh, we're not yet uh, as, uh, let's say, as implemented as solar or as wind, but they also started many, many years you know, before us. So we're a new technology and really my dream and hope is that in the future, uh, we will see wave power installed on every breakwater in the world. And even the new breakwaters that are just being planned will already incorporate in the planning stage wave energy into them. So how does the actual wave energy compare in its, in its uh, impact and sustainability to solar and wind, for example? How, how big of a deal is this going to be a part of the world? You know, obviously we can both agree that the world will be green one day or another. It's gonna happen at some point, maybe it's 100 years from now, maybe it's 30 years from now. But my question is, you know, from your perspective, how big of a role is, is wave power? Because I haven't heard too much about wave power until now. And that's why I was also so excited to hear about it because I'm just starting to try to understand and we need to do many more episodes for me to truly understand what's happening. Yeah, so wave power is an immense source of electricity, of clean electricity. According to the World Energy Council, wave energy can actually produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. 
Now, the clear advantage of weight really? power, except, uh, yeah, <laughs> the clear advantage is that two thirds also of the world population is living on the coastline. So with this type of population distribution, the need for wave energy is undeniable. You can save a lot of the transmission costs by just bringing the energy from the coastline to the houses, to the population. Uh, other than that, wave energy in suitable locations can operate around the clock 24-7, day and night, as opposed to solar energy that, of course, in the night you cannot produce any electricity. But although really my passion is wave energy, I don't think that uh, one type of renewable energy technology is the solution for the world's problems. I really think that we need to combine all renewable energy sources, if it's waves, if it's solar, if it's wind, if it's tidal, all of the sources will be the answer to the world's problem and will be able to provide 100% renewable energy uh, electricity to the world. And uh, that's why I really believe that all of us, we should work together and we should support each other in order to have, you know, in each country you have different prevailing sources. Some countries don't have sun but have a lot of wind or a lot of wave and some countries are vice versa. So basically everybody needs to work together in order to enable the world to become 100% environmentally friendly because really that's the future of our children. And, and what needs to happen? So what is, the, what is the big problem? Is it the fact that the technology is a little premature still? Is it the fact that governments aren't, and aren't experienced enough and when, they, when they're installing these new breakwaters, you, you're saying here, rightfully so, you know, we're installing new breakwaters every day. They should be already integrated with, this, with collecting the electricity, but you also need to go back and fix all the ones that we already have. And I'm guessing there's millions of them around the world, right? Yeah, there's a lot, uh, there's many, many unused breakwaters, of course, in every place that there's a sea or an ocean, which is wavy, you would put a breakwater to protect the coastal population. I think that the main problem or, or what makes it a bit difficult to reach full commercial rollout is the fact that whereas we are in a very high technological readiness stage in terms of the technology, so we can build it pretty fast and the technology is modular, uh, governments and the uh, policy uh, setters, they basically just now starting to learn about wave energy. Like throughout the years, they saw all these right. uh, big offshore experiments that have been made, uh, that have failed, that have broken down, that have cost like tremendous amount of money. And they thought to themselves, okay, wave energy is nowhere near commercialization. So why would we spend our time in setting policy or regulatory fr frameworks right. or legislation or anything? So then now what happens is that actually we do feel comfortable with our technology and we do feel that we can make it happen. And our construction time is not that long, you know, for a small station it can be as little as six months, for a large station is uh, 24 months, but still it's not a lot of time. But really what kind of uh, impedes us or slows us down is the fact that, that let's say a port approaches us and they say we want your wave energy technology and we say great, your port is really suitable, we want to install it there. What are, what's the steps, like which kind of licenses do we need to do, what do we need to submit? And then the port says, we don't know, like there's no regulation, there's no policy, how to connect to the grid, how to connect to the breakwater, and that kind of, kind of slows us down. Uh, I will say on a positive note that wind and solar energy went through the same route. When they started, there were, were also no tariffs and no policies and no frameworks for the implementation of those technologies. So when you're new, of course, it takes time for most countries to get familiar and to set the policy, but it is a shame that we can build it so fast and the ports and the muni coastal municipalities and the coastal countries are really interested and what slows us down is like paperwork, you know? That's something that's really burning in me, like I wanna do more, build more and do it faster. And like sometimes I feel that I'm being like slowed down by, you know, not so relevant. Uh, yeah. We need many, many more people like you. I, I'm leaving this conversation with, uh, you know, tingles. I'm, I'm like, and I'm so inspired. And I already want to set a date for another episode that we're going to do uh, for the show, because I just love your outlook. I love your passion. I love your, your understanding of things and, and your directness that it's, you know, you're, you're saying it as it is. And, and I just love it completely. You know, so thank you first, first of all, very much for sh coming here and sharing this with me. 20 minutes go by way, way too fast. And I have three fun yet crucial questions I must ask. Uh, first one is, what was your favorite subject in school? So I really like to study uh, Bible for some reason. Uh, I really like wow. the stories and the analyzing of the, you know, the historical events. 
and I actually had the highest uh, grade in school uh, in uh, you know uh, in the in sixth grade probably I had the highest uh, score out of all the other subjects. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think we had a great teacher that knew how to you know Amazing. explain it and talk about it. So, by the way, sports was my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beautiful. Uh, now, yeah, uh, yeah. one of your role models. Who is one of your role models? So I really like the personal life story of Jeff Ma because his life story really emphasized that you should never give up. Uh, Jeff Ma, it's very famous that uh, he was rejected from KFC. Like they didn't even want to enable him to sell chicken. <laughs> Uh, he tried to uh, go to Harvard a number of times and he was rejected from there as well. Uh, he was a school teacher and he went to work at an industry, like he didn't have any expertise in e-commerce, but he still uh, was able to establish one of the largest websites in the world for that. Like, although kind of life kept telling him no, 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 in different, uh, you know, routes that he tried to take, he still never gave up and was really persistent. And, uh, and that's something that I really appreciate. Uh, I love it. And the last question, which uh, is not the most important one, but it's another interesting one. Three words you would choose to describe yourself. Uh, I think passion, like, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And, uh, you know, I always say that it looks like uh, when you're having a heart attack and they're showing you your cardiac, uh, you know, the, how it's called, cardiogram. And uh, it's going right. up and it's going down. So that's of, uh, the life of an uh, entrepreneur. So you really, really need to have passion. And I think uh, I'm really like excited and passionate about what I'm doing, which really helps me yes. along the lows. Uh, too persistent. Uh, like, again, I had many difficult... Again, I opened the company when I was 24. I didn't have the technical expertise. I didn't have the funding. I didn't have the contacts. I grew up with a very small city in Israel called Akko. So really, like, if I wouldn't, you know, persisted, persisted uh, at what I'm doing, then uh, it wouldn't happen and we couldn't uh, establish and accomplish what we've accomplished so far. And I think also the third thing is probably uh, creativity. Uh, because uh, many yes. times when you're working at a, kind of a very new industry and, uh, you know, people kind of don't know what you're talking about, you, you definitely have to take a creative approach to explaining things, to achieving things, and so So I think this is the free uh, thing. I, I love it. Thank you very, very much, Ina. I appreciate your time so, so much. Uh, I, can, I look forward to yeah. continue following what you're doing with your company and, and helping the world be a better place, literally. So thank you and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much.